Local COVID-19 updates from the experts. What to know from UT Southwestern. Hello, I'm Dr. John Warner, Executive Vice President for Health System Affairs at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Welcome to this week's episode of UT Southwestern's What to Know. With this series, we like to take a topic of interest in, around healthcare and discuss it with an expert to let you know what UT Southwestern is thinking, what that expert is thinking, and what you should be thinking about as you prioritize the needs of your own healthcare and that of your family and friends. So with us today is Dr. Brad Kutrell, who's the Medical Director of Antibiotic Stewardship at UT Southwestern. What Antibiotic Stewardship is, is a program designed to help doctors, nurses, and other providers choose the right antibiotics for a specific infection. And so what we'd like to do today with Dr. Kutrell is to have him tell us a little bit about the therapies that are evolving for coronavirus and tell us a little bit about the potential of those, how they work, and how they might be applied to eliminating this awful infection. So welcome, Dr. Kutrell. Thank you so much for the invitation, Dr. Warner. So Dr. Kutrell, in general, drugs that treat infection work in two ways. They either directly attack the infection and kill it, or they slow it down so your body can eliminate it itself. So either pausing the infection or diminishing the spread of the infection so your body's own immune response can take over and hopefully eliminate the infection. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how these potential drugs are working against COVID-19 and some of the drugs you feel are most promising. That's a great way to think about uh, the different drugs uh, that have been proposed as possible treatments for COVID-19. So the first large category are, are medicines that target the virus itself. And as we've learned more about the virus, there are a number of different aspects of the virus life cycle that are potential targets for drug treatments. Uh, one of the medications that has shown some promise and people have probably heard about is an IV medication called remdesivir. This is an antiviral medicine that blocks the protein that the virus uses to make copies of its RNA or its genetic material. Uh, now, we don't know yet whether or not this medicine is going to be effective, but there are a number of large-scale uh, randomized trials, um, including some that we're conducting here at UT Southwestern, that will hopefully answer the question of whether this medicine will be effective and safe. Uh, a second group of medications that people have probably heard a lot about on the media is hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. These are medicines that we've used for a long, long time to treat other infections like malaria, or to treat anti-inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Uh, but it was discovered early on that these medicines could potentially have uh, use in treating the virus or also in, in modifying the immune response to this virus. Now, early on, there were some small studies uh, that got a lot of attention and, and raised people's possible hopes for this, uh, but there were some limitations to these studies, including the fact that they did not have a control arm, meaning we didn't have a comparator group to really be able to establish if the medicines were safe and effective. Uh, so there are currently uh, multiple ongoing trials looking at chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, and they may still show some benefit. Uh, but I think uh, the national guidelines that have been put out by the NIH and, and other groups have really emphasized the fact that we still don't have any proven effective treatments uh, at this date. The second large category of medications would be medicines that can affect or modify the immune response. And one of the things that we're learning more about the body is that some of the patients who get quite sick from COVID-19 is because their body mounts an exaggerated immune response. And so there are, there are medications including uh, steroids and a class of medicines called IL-6 blocking agents uh, that try to help dampen down that exaggerated immune response. And so those are also being studied in clinical trials to see if they may be helpful. So Dr. Kutrell, at UT Southwestern, more than a third of the patients admitted to the hospital have been enrolled in one of these clinical trials. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how important it is that we're testing these drugs along the way, particularly since we had no known cure going in and we're developing these drugs in many ways on the fly as we test them against the infection. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. And really one of the, the key messages is that when available, as many patients as are eligible need to be enrolled in these clinical trials. In medicine, you know, we can, we can make uh, assumptions about what might be helpful, but really the gold standard is to do a trial uh, where patients are randomized either to receive a medicine or to be in a control arm 
And really that's the way that it allows us to determine if they're safe and if they're effective. And so we here at UT Southwestern, uh, with the benefit of Dr. Mopta Jane and many other colleagues, uh, have been very active in enrolling patients in these clinical trials because we all feel the urgency and the need to identify what, what are going to be the best treatments for these patients. So, so I echo that that's really an important part of how, how we discover how to treat this virus. So if you're a patient who gets infected with COVID-19, when should you be thinking about um, wh whether you need a drug or not? We know that most patients recover, most people recover from COVID-19 without the need of a drug. So how should someone decide if they're infected with COVID-19, whether they go to the hospital and whether or not they should be thinking about whether they need a drug or just supportive care, rest, fluids, and, uh, and recovering from the illness on their own? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. And honestly, that's probably the question I get most often from family and friends in the community when, when they're talking to me or asking me about these questions. So I think, as you mentioned, for, for most patients, uh, if they get infected with uh, COVID-19, they may have fevers, they may have a cough, they may feel sick, but most likely what's based on what we are seeing, they will recover. And so for those patients, we're recommending supportive care and that they remain at home, that they contact their their uh, medical provider and, and advise them of what's going on. It's really those patients who start to develop some of the more concerning symptoms like uh, worsening shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, uh, maybe inability to keep down their medications or fluids. Those are the patients where it's really important that they seek medical attention and may need to be put into the hospital because it could be a sign that they're transitioning to one of the more severe stages of the infection that, that would really require some of the specific treatments or uh, might allow them to be enrolled in some of the clinical trials. Now, obviously, this could change, and so there are ongoing studies uh, in people who have milder infections, and so if it becomes clear that treatment at that early stage is also effective, we could change that guidance. But for now, uh, for those who, who don't have those more serious signs, we're encouraging them to stay home, self-isolate, do all of the you know things that, that we're advising patients to protect themselves and those around them. So Dr. Kutrell, the one topic has been around what's called convalescent plasma. So the using someone's blood who's recovered from the infection to treat the infection in someone who's developed the COVID-19 infection. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how, what that program might mean for studying this disease and potentially treating it? Sure. So convalescent plasma is actually not a new uh, technique in medicine. We've been using it for, for over a century. It was used back in the 1918 pandemic influenza uh, outbreak. It's basically the concept that once someone has recovered from the infection, their body has produced proteins we call antibodies that can help provide protection. And so if we can, someone can donate that plasma and we can give it to someone who's sick, the theory is that that might help them also recover from the infection. So we're fortunate uh, here at UT Southwestern, there's actually a national convalescent plasma donation program that was arranged by the uh, FDA and the Mayo Clinic. And there are over 2,000 clinical sites that are participating, including UT Southwestern and our partner institutions. And so we have a way, there's a very nice website uh, where if you've recovered from COVID-19, you can fill out a form and see if you may be a candidate for plasma donation. And then for our patients who are in the hospital, we now have treated almost 10 patients uh, in the last several weeks with convalescent plasma. And so we're we're hopeful and we're watching closely how those patients respond to see if this is gonna be uh, an effective treatment for this disease. So if you are a patient who's recovered from COVID-19, you can go directly to the UT Southwestern website just uh, and look at the COVID-19 section. And there's a way for you to access that questionnaire that Dr. Kutrell referred to, to determine if you're a candidate to donate your plasma to potentially benefit other patients who have the infection. So Dr. Kutrell, as we begin to think about what would hopefully be a recovery from this horrible pandemic, what do you think is likely to occur? Well, there's sort of two things in my mind that, uh, that could happen. One is we develop a drug that would quickly treat the infection and prevent some of the serious consequences that could happen. And then likely a vaccine that could prevent the infection from spreading and perhaps eradicate that. Can you tell us a little bit about where we are with those types of strategies and how you see the next year playing out? Sure. So obviously none of us have a crystal ball, but I, I do think 
it's likely that one or more of the treatments or maybe even other treatments will prove to be effective. Uh, you know, many treatments in medicine uh, provide an incremental benefit, but it's rare that we see something that, you know, completely eliminates a disease in terms of a, of a drug treatment. So because of that, I do think the development efforts around a vaccine are going to be very important to, to ultimately try to control this pandemic. Fortunately, there's a lot of attention and work going on. Uh, there are already six vaccines uh, that are currently in phase one clinical trials, including uh, the first one that was started by the NIH uh, back in March uh, up in Seattle. And so I think we're all very hopeful in watching those. Uh, the vaccine development, unlike the drug development, does take a bit more time. Um, people may have heard the 12 to 18 month suggestion, and, and I would say that's an optimistic if everything goes right. Uh, we could have a vaccine maybe by next spring or summer, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort. And so we're watching those efforts very closely uh, here at UT Southwestern to be able to offer those to our patients if, if those are successful. So Dr. Kutrell, as the last week is, uh, has played out, we've seen some loosening of the restrictions uh, at both the state and local level as we begin to be allowed to go to restaurants, to uh, to do more shopping than what we've done and to just be out and about uh, more than we have been before under these restrictions that we've all been living under for a couple of months. As an infectious disease doctor, tell us a few things you're thinking about as you prioritize the safety of, your, of you and your family as these restrictions evolve. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, the foremost question on everyone's mind and certainly have been getting a lot of those questions. The way I'm thinking about it is I know that, you know, this period of being uh, shelter in place and, and the so-called lockdown has been difficult for everyone, uh, you know, physically, emotionally, uh, from an economic or business standpoint. And so I, I think we all understand that we have to uh, be thoughtful about how we emerge from from that. Uh, it's It's been very heartening to see, you know, I think our state and local officials are listening to the medical experts and, and doing this in an incremental and gradual fashion. Uh, I think that really each person is going to have to think about they, themselves, their own health, their own health conditions, and their own family and, and kind of make some of those uh, decisions about when they feel comfortable to to start to loosen up some of the restrictions. I do think it's going to be critical and, and plans are in place to do that, certainly here at UT Southwestern and within the state and, and the county, to monitor closely because it may be that we start to see an increase in the number of cases and so we'll have to be ready at that point to, to possibly reinstitute or, or, or modify our approach. Uh, so I, I think uh, this virus is going to be with us for a while, as I mentioned, until we are able to develop a successful vaccine and so it's going to take all of us you know, being in this together and, and being thoughtful uh, as we gradually uh, emerge from from the the shelter in place and the the other lockdown lockdown restrictions. Well, thank you for joining us, Dr. Kutrell, and thank you for all the great work that you're providing, not only at UT Southwestern, but you and your team are providing to the whole North Texas community. So thanks again for joining us, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of uh, UT Southwestern's What to Know.